Hello, everyone, and welcome to season four, episode seven of Energy versus Climate. My name is Ed Whittingham, and as always, I'm joined by my co hosts, Sarah Hastings Simon and David Keith. It's good to be back after an extended winter break. Well, uh, as it's been for much of the past half decade, at least, the topic of just transition is making headlines again. Uh, on, Fe- on February 17th, the government of Canada released its much anticipated interim plan for its just transition legislation. Of course, the government of Canada has now expunged the term just transition from its lexicon and is asking actively others to do the same and instead use uh, the rechristened sustainable jobs term. Uh, Today, by the way, we're going to wholly ignore the federal government's request and also note that they released their interim report on a take out the trash Friday afternoon. And this is probably because their plan had already taken a sound beating from places like Alberta before even a word of the report had been formally published. So today on Energy versus Climate, we're going to cover the topic of just transition, though we're going to do our best to avoid diving too much into its politicization. That's been adequately covered in other outlets, uh, including through a couple of CBC West of Center shows, one of which uh, one of which uh, Sarah was a guest on, and you can find a link to that show in our own show notes when this drops as a pod. Uh, instead, today we're going to try to separate the politics from the policies and the on-the-ground practices when it comes to transition. What can we learn from coal communities that have already started down the transition path? What have policymakers got right in previous transition supports, and what have they got wrong? And what does this mean for provincial and federal governments who seem chronically at war with each other while facing economic transition on provincial and national scales? So to help us answer these questions and more, we're thankfully joined by someone eminently qualified to speak to the issue. DeRay Vino is the executive director of the Lynx Harvest Sky Services and Support Society, formerly known as the Hannah Learning Center in Hannah, Alberta. Some of you out there may know Hannah as the home of Nickelback, but until 2021, it was also the home of the Sheerness Coal Mine and the Sheerness Coal Fired Generating Plant. Now the mine has closed, is in the process of transitioning itself and being rehabilitated, and the generating plant has converted from coal to natural gas, which has had a uh, dramatic effect on jobs that previously existed in the community between the two projects. So DeRay is really on the front lines of citizen engagement, organizational development, and capacity building in a community that is really going through rapid energy transition. She holds a Bachelor of Arts in Recreation Administration Community Development from the University of Alberta. And I assume, DeRay, you're joining us from Hannah today? That's correct. Glad to be here. Welcome. Uh, We're really grateful to to have you on. So the format for today's will introduce DeRay and Hannah's energy transition approach uh, off the top. Uh, Then I'll guide us through some questions until about 45 minutes past the hour. And after that, we'll have our usual 15 minutes of Q&A. Feel free to send in your questions via the Q&A box throughout the webinar. And remember to not use the raise hand function or the chat box. Cool. All right. Uh, DeRay, so let's dive right in. First off, like just tell us about the impact that Alberta's coal phase-out decision going back to November 22nd, 2015. And I know that because I was actually standing on a stage uh, behind uh, then-Premier Rachel Notley when she made the decision to phase out coal in Alberta by 2030. But tell us about the impact that has had on Hannah and then just briefly, like, what you're doing in terms of supports for your workers and for your community. Excellent. So yeah, 2015 um, was a crisis. Uh, With the announcement, there was the ultimate fear of the unknown and what does it look like Mm -hmm. for our community. And very quickly, um, there started to be camps in our region of ideas and, and people. There was uh, the 
denial, complete denial. Individuals like, oh, don't be ridiculous. This isn't going to happen. There were the individuals that the next day put their house up for sale. This is a crisis. We got to get out of here while we can. There was another camp that said, okay, whoa, oh, let's maybe take a deep breath, take a step back and see what the true impacts are and what we can do to mitigate if those are negative impacts. Um, so a task force was formed um, right away in 2015, and it was made up of Town of Hanna, Special Areas Rep, our Economic Development Manager at the time, um, and then would bring in folks from the community um, to start planning you know, our process moving forward. Um, they did invest some dollars right away into hiring consultant that um, completed two studies for our region. So there was an impact studies completed and there was an opportunities studies completed. Um, with that, we moved forward and we did receive some, when I say we, it's our community, it could have been the town of Hannah, it could have been special areas, it could have been at that time Cactus Corner, now is Harvest Guy, economic development, um, securing some provincial dollars, some, you know, a little drop in the bucket to help us with some planning moving forward. Um, right. And you're right, sorry to interrupt, just because special yeah. areas, I became familiar with it, but it's yeah. it's kind of almost unique to your area. It's like a special well, area. Can you just give like the one line definition of what is special areas and its relationship to Hannah? So it's our rural municipality. So we are not a have county. We have special areas. Gotcha. Thanks. Okay. Yeah, no bad. Um, so as we evolved to um, creating some um, programs and community development in our community, we it was called community action teams were formed. So we were going right grassroots to our community for their ideas to diversify, like the diversification in the economy, um, you know, also how could we, you know, limit the Im negative impacts. Um, there was some amazing projects that, um, you know, started being built, um, but there was no follow through capital dollars. There was no, at that time, um, it was all volunteer based by so many community members that were just champions that say, I have this idea, can you help me make a plan? Let's see if it'll work. But then there wasn't the the follow through to support those ideas with capital dollars in which so many of them needed capital dollars. Um, we also had the opportunity to um, start working on, and this was a task force initiative with our community um, energy project. Um, so hours and hours and hours of time and meetings and you know what that looked like for creating a training center attached to it went into the the planning of that and you know with support from government provincial government at the time thought we were on the right path and then very uh, abruptly came to a halt when when that project wa was not approved and the task force ultimate vision behind the project was there would be you know revenue to support community projects community development from the, the solar panel uh, farm that they were planning on building. Um, so, Dre, I, I want to actually want to unpack that project idea because, full disclosure, you and I got to know each other uh, through mm -hmm. that project. But first, going back, because you talked about the negative impacts and the day it happened, there are negative impacts that people feared. Mm -hmm. And now here we are, you know, we're 2023. So, we're seven years, uh, not quite seven years after that announcement, 2015. Mm -hmm. I'd like to know what negative impacts have actually played out. One you mentioned was property values. Mm -hmm. And I remember when I visited Hannah, started visiting Hannah in like 2018, already some property values had decreased by 30% mm -hmm. since prior. And you could draw a straight line between pre-coal announcement and post-coal coal announcement. A hundred percent. A hundred percent. What are some of the other negative impacts you were worried about? And then ones that have actually played out on the ground. So we also seen a significant increase in domestic violence. Um, so there was the social lens um, because we have to look at 
this announcement um, as not just affecting jobs. Um, you know, as, as a human, job is one part of our world. Um, so there was, you know, significant increase in addictions. There was significant increase in domestic violent reported mm -hmm. cases. Um, so there was a feeling of hopelessness and al almost a social unraveling. Um, but the big, one of the biggest things was that people didn't know what the next announcement or the next process was going to be. So I actually believe the not knowing was one of the most difficult components of the transition. Um, if people would have known, okay, on January 12th, 2020, um, this is what's going to happen. You can prep and you can, you know, you have the ability for some, use some coping skills, but it was a continuous not knowing, or we think this is going to happen. And let's face it, most of us, human nature, create the worst case scenario in our heads, you know, so our most worried things usually don't ever happen, mm -hmm. but people didn't know. And we didn't know. And that was probably, I think, as a community, was one of the hardest, most difficult part of it. Um, and the negative um, components of, you know, those folks and then throw a global pandemic in there when then people are isolated too, um, to not have the opportunity to build the relationships and walk through that process together as a community was, was really messy. Yeah. Yeah. And so full disclosure, we can talk about the project that we were involved in and reminisce a bit. It was great on paper. It was never realized. And I think it was a tragedy, but just so you know, like, I was involved, um, and as was Sarah at the time, uh, in that push to phase out coal and to convince the Notley government to make that commitment. And yet, a couple of years later, when I spent time, significant time in Hannah, I really got to understand the human dimension of that. <laughs> it's easy to make that you know, announcement and with a stroke of a pen from a, a capital city in a province. It's much different when you're spending time in the community and seeing the on the ground impact that that decision has had uh, well, and, and all the disruption. And I think that's really something that we need to be mindful of in these conversations. Yes, there's always going to be politics involved and we, and we really would love good policy developed, but people, that's that people need to be the center of both those conversations. Yeah. So let's let's just do like 30 seconds on that project, which is kind of like a makeup call that we tried to pull off and didn't. So it's called the Hannah Solar Center Project. You, you want to do the summary? No, go ahead. Okay. Okay. It, it was I have some emotions attached to it. <laughs> sure, sure. So I was uh and working with uh my consultants hat on working with Green Gate Power, with Atco Power and the town of Hannah and special areas. And what we tried to do is at the time uh, build what it would have been the largest solar project in Canada uh, on the reclaimed coal mine, on the, the Westmoreland coal mine site. The neat thing is we wanted to bring in a special areas in the town of Hannah as owners, and we would take from revenue of the project, it was estimated two and a half to four million in annual income, and then Hannah and special areas would put that into the Hannah Community Coal Transition Fund. So it'd be a self-generating fund to help with long-term economic transition. And it was also to serve as a national model, we'd hope, for communities going through transition. And DeRay was involved because we had the Hannah Solar Center of Excellence attached to it, which was really a retraining center idea where people could go to the solar project and actually part of the project itself would have you know, uh, panels uh, where you could go in and you know, tinker around with that you know, would give you live on the ground retraining and to actually then take former coal workers and try to help them learn the trade of being renewable energy installers. So 
did tell me Dre if I've missed anything on that if not we can sort of go broader again no you didn't miss anything I, on a very very small scale uh, in relation to training um, we did have the opportunity to do a week-long um, solar panel installation uh, training in our community and uh, special areas was able to provide some tuition bursaries for 12 students to complete that. Um, and we wrap that up um, the week before the world closed down with COVID. So that worked out well for timing. Um, so a, a small, you know, 12 individuals in our region um, were supported with that training opportunity. Um, so on a very tiny, tiny, small scale, there was a little bit of a follow through on that grand idea. Yeah. So I think we'll pick this up, this project up and its failure when we go to now to our first group discussion topic. What have policymakers gotten right and what have they got wrong? Maybe, Sarah, I'll give you the first crack. You've been you've been talking about this publicly through media a lot recently. So uh, and you've seen the sustainable jobs report now that it's out. What do you what's your first thought on on what policymakers are getting right and wrong? Well, there's obviously a lot in there, so I'll give a, a kind of a, a few thoughts there. I mean, I think for me, first and foremost, like starting to plan is is necessary. And I think there's examples, you know, across whether it's within Canada or, you know, across the U.S. as well of both, right, of cases where policymakers have sort of chosen to stick their head in the sand um, and and kind of pretend it's not happening and therefore not plan. And that, you know, to me, that's the the worst way to get it wrong or the best way, I don't know. But if you don't plan for it at all, obviously you're you're going to get it horribly wrong. It does start to lean in a little bit into the politics, obviously, of why someone might choose to ignore that. But I think first and foremost is simply you got to like confront the issue mm -hmm. and, and start to plan for it. Um, I think when it comes to then what you do around it, I think another place where, again, you know, and there's probably good and bad examples here when it comes to what kind of supports and really who you're supporting. And I think that there is, to me, there's a pretty bright line between, you know, the role of governments in just transition to support the communities and the, you know, people, uh, the, whether they're, I was going to say citizens, but not just citizens, right? The people that live in our and in work in our communities, um, that's really different than government's responsibility to investors, right? And that is sort of the, you know, fundamental idea of, of capitalism, if you want, that, you know, investors are sort of making uh, bets or, or sort of, you know, think that they can have, have good ideas about where things are going. And, and sometimes they, you know, sometimes those pay off and sometimes they don't. And it's not really the role of government, um, other than maybe in some very specific cases, you know, we could get into it on the on the coal phase out even to, to step in and actually compensate investors if, you know, markets and uh, things go in a direction different than what they're expecting. On the other hand, it is very much the job of governments to provide support for those individuals and whether that's, you know, job retraining and uh, unemployment support and early retirement, you know, that basket of things. So I think that's a that's another one. Um, and then the third that, you know, I'll, I'll thank Dore is, is one of the people that certainly having heard this story and, you know, having had a chance to talk with her before, I think really has gotten me thinking more about how it's really, you know, Just Transition is a very good example of the importance of intersectionality in government policy, right? And I think, especially when you're talking about, you know, the energy sector and sort of the temptation to, um, you know, make these policies from this very like techno lens, it's very easy to miss some of those elements, you know, that you mentioned around families and domestic violence and, um, and, and kind of hopelessness that leads to all these other challenges. And that those can only be addressed if you really bring in kind of that, that intersectional lens to what's required. And I think that that's one where, you know, certainly historically, governments, I think, as a whole, haven't really done a very good job of that. We're maybe starting to try to understand that, like, we at least should. Um, but I think that actually goes all the way through, you know, I don't place the blame just on governments. Mm -hmm. um, I think it also comes back to the way that we think about, you know, what universities are teaching, right? And and for me, um, that's something that's really important in my role as a professor, thinking about, you know, the education that we're giving, particularly to students that are coming out of technical fields, the importance of making sure 
sure that they are getting an understanding of these other components of the social side of our social technical system so that they can also be, uh, you know, prepared and be champions for um, incorporating this kind of thinking into what they're doing. So there's some really, I think, fundamental changes that have to come all the way along, you know, our policy making, but all the way back to our educational systems that will really allow us to create the right kind of policies to to address this big shift that's coming in, in Canadian society. Yeah, and I want to turn to David, but just a couple of quick thoughts. One is um, with understanding the human dimension, for me, my personal journey was spending time in Hannah. And as I say, it was one thing to push for coal phase. It was another thing to be in a community and spend time there, seeing the on the ground impacts of that decision. Second one, just to your second point, Sarah, if you'll recall at Pembina, we published a report around the time of coal phase out saying that the government of Alberta was not legally <laughs> bound to compensate the utilities if it were to move forward with coal phase out. Immediately, we became persona non grata or group non grata with the utility companies. Like literally, they would not talk to us after we published that. And the government of Alberta, and I know it's tough, but, you know, made the right decision in the end, compensated shareholders. And unfortunately, by the end of the term of the Notley government had done relatively little to uh, to help communities like Hannah. It was, I won't say it's easy, but the compensation part was relatively quick. Helping coal communities transition proved to be hard and difficult, and they didn't check many boxes. But over, David, over, over to you. Sure. Um, I mean, the human costs of energy transitions are going to be hard. For sure, and and no escaping that with these real human costs you see going through the community, like you've talked about, um, the human costs of other big technology econ transitions are are also hard. And you can think of the really big ones that have happened this century. I mean, the enormous movement of people away from agriculture into the cities, the transition we're seeing between manufacturing and service sector. These are big transitions where where there are big shakeups in society, and I think. Our society should do a much better job paying attention and helping the human costs. I think the thing where I want to maybe take a different view than what people assume is that I don't think because it's the energy transition, we should necessarily be focused on new clean energy jobs as the solution. I think it's completely clear that governments have a duty and, and a, an interest in good governance in providing things that make uh, economic transitions easier. That means things like healthcare, really good educational sports, especially educational supports that go to the lowest half of the income distribution. We have too much educational support that effectively supports people who are going to make pretty high salaries anyway. Those are things that already Canada has better than some other Western democracies. And it's part of why it's easier for people to change jobs in Canada, because you don't lose your healthcare when you change your job. Um, there's a kind of assumption in some, not all, of the just transition conversation that assumes that we have to couple the jobs that go away in dirty energy with new jobs in clean energy. And I think that just makes no sense. I mean, if if you know we had maybe this will seem to be trivializing it, but I mean, if we had you know a, a, a huge number of jobs in dog sitting and they were going away because people didn't have dogs anymore or whatever, didn't have robots to sit them, and and in you wouldn't assume that the right thing for the government to do was to focus on cat sitting. You'd say, well, this is really important. If some communities are really dependent on dog sitting, we need to find ways to, to transition. We need to find ways for to make social justice in those transitions, but but we shouldn't overfocus on the energy part. So I guess my really big policy picture where I think policymakers are kind of getting it wrong in Canada is I feel we should decouple the two policies. We need to have a policy that does energy transition, and we need to have a general policy that makes our society more resilient against all sorts of economic transitions that are always happening and always hurting some communities. And we need to find ways to support those communities in their transition, whatever caused it. And what I'm not sure we need to do is couple those two things tightly. I actually think that's not a benefit. Yeah. And and David, so that's, that's a great point because with this Hannah Solar Project proposal, that DeRay and I were involved in that ultimately failed. I think one of the fail points was because when we we're going and we we're you know asking for support from the provincial government in the form of a contract for difference policy and basically some seed capital. But repeatedly they say, oh great, because we know, and this was finger math at the time, a hundred jobs at the mine, a hundred jobs at the Sheerness generating facility. And the thinking was you're going to lose all the jobs at the mine. And when you could go from coal to gas, 
you're going to have your workforce. So net, net, you're losing 150 of 200 jobs. So tell us with the solar project, how many jobs are you creating? And then to be, uh, well, that's not the point because we create construction jobs, but we were proposing 120 megawatt solar project. When it came to operating, operating yep. jobs, yep. very few, right? Yep. And, very- and yeah, and this is the stuff we've talked about before on this, on this uh, uh, podcast, that if you think about kind of Alberta overall, not, which of course is all made up of communities like Hannah, communities of big cities. I mean, in the end, a province is all about individual people with their concerns. If, if the conventional oil and gas and coal industry goes down, which it will and it needs to, um, uh, the idea that we are sort of an energy place and automatically transition to that, maybe in some cases, yes. But remember that there's a big economic value add in oil and gas because we're producing something the rest of the world wants. So the inputs of labor and capital are small compared to the outputs. That's what drives the wonderful Alberta economy. If we're installing solar panels or wind turbines that are mostly made elsewhere, in economist terms, there's not much value added to the economy, even if we made the environment better. And I do think we need obviously transition to clean energy, but it might be that the thing that is the future value add that really drives Alberta to be really successful, you know, when our kids are, are, are older, that might be something pretty different from energy. I think we don't know. We have to be open to different kinds of light manufacturing or robots or who knows what. What we need to do is is provide ways to ease the transition for people who are harmed, wherever, whatever reason harmed them. Yeah. And going back to that project, what made it less sexy for politicians was it's not a one-for-one job replacement. In many ways, it was a tax-based replacement. And that you bring yeah. in Hannah and special areas as owners, you create the coal transition fund. As owners, they would get two and a half to four million bucks a year, which they could use to replace a tax hit and then for retraining. But that that just it ended up, there are many reasons why that project failed, but it was just a less sexy idea than a politician standing up, cutting a ribbon and saying, we're creating X hundred or X thousands of new jobs through this project. But I, yeah, go ahead. It's one more really short one. I do want to say that I think there's a different responsibility for the energy transition, which is, of course, significantly driven by policy, policies to shift us from high emissions to low emissions infrastructure. Because the government is driving those policies, I think the government does have in general an added uh, uh, responsibility to pay attention to harms from that, which we wouldn't have from just kind of changes in the economy that have maybe equally hard consequences for people, but aren't driven so much by government policy. So some of the changes we're seeing to service sector are not driven in any simple direct way by government policy. DeRay, so I want to bring it back to you because, and maybe you can comment on this notion of replacing an energy worker or helping an energy worker to transition to become a clean energy worker versus some other field like a remote web designer or remote co- coder. Like what's the approach that you're taking in HANA and maybe give us some examples of actually transitioning uh, a former coal worker who obviously, or I won't say obviously, but we assume wants to continue to live in HANA, raise a family in HANA, but transitioning them into some other profession without having that person to pick up and move to Calgary or Edmonton or Houston or wherever it is. And that's been one of the biggest factors is so many of those individuals, um, you know, their families have been long-term residents of our region and a lot of them are connected to agriculture. Um, You know, there's family farms and ranches that have been, you know, part of their family dynamics for over a century. Um, So the option to... um, just relocate um, didn't make sense in their future um, that they wanted to provide for for their family. Um, We did see, you know, some people, um, you know, taking jobs to do a fly in, fly out. And that then really changed family dynamics as well, because now dad is away, you know, for maybe half the month and mom now is actually a single parent. Um, So that dynamics changed. Um, As far as the um, retraining, we've had limited success in, um, and I don't know if that's our rural 
entrepreneurship is, no, I'm not going to retrain to do a job for somebody else. I'm going to start my own business. So we've had more of the initiative and and my t- team at our business hub, which we are fortunate to move a community action project to a bigger project with support from um, Western Economic Diversification Funding. You know, we've been able to walk alongside some of those individuals to help them establish um, their own businesses. Um, so as far as retraining um, to get a job somewhere else or a job to work for somewhere else someone else we haven't seen as much of that there's been some of course um, but more so of smart starting small businesses that are maybe connected to their agriculture Sarah I know you want to jump in Yeah, I just wanted to pick up, I mean, it's a little bit on this theme of sort of where you go and where you see coupling versus not. And I think that, you know, definitely agree with with David. And it sounds like, Dory, that there's even that idea of coupling of people, you know, having to go from one position that sort of looks like the same type of role in terms of working for a big company um, is also not, you know, necessarily uh, required. I think there are, there is one element where, you know, building out some of that energy infrastructure does make sense aside from the tax base. And that's just using, making use of the infrastructure that's there, right? And so having that transmission uh, interconnection um, that, you know, could could host a wind or solar project, um, particularly as we know, you know, not just unique to Alberta, but across North America, um, interconnection spots for new wind and solar development are, you know, increasingly hard to come by. And so I think that is also um, a good reason to think about ways to transition um, to other energy sources within those communities. And then the challenge becomes, as Ed's saying, you know, you don't get to stand and ribbon cutting in front of a transmission infrastructure. It doesn't have quite the same uh, political play. Um, and yet somehow we need to, I think, make that part of our planning. Um, you know, the other coupling piece, and and I don't know how much that came up in, in Hannah as well too, but I, I can't help but mention, you know, this concept of just transition, I think the way that we talk about it sometimes in Canada is actually slightly different than the origin of the word, right? Where often it's it's kind of become a stand-in for making sure that people who had, you know, sort of, we'll call them good jobs, jobs that were able to support a family um, and, and kind of a certain standard of living prior to the transition that they're able to kind of transition over and keep that standard of living. Of course, the the term, and I think a lot of the early work within that space was really around this concept of, you know, if we are going to have this massive transition to our economy, how do we do that in a way that making sure that it's creating opportunities for those within our communities who had been, you know, left out of the, of the current system. And so that is another, it adds another challenge to the the mandate in terms of you know obviously it's a, it's a whole other bucket to to tackle and yet at the same time i think it's um you know to me it's always sort of made sense aside from an equity argument but it's made sense that this logic of you know yes it's going to be harder to try to solve two two issues at the same time but that you have this sort of opportunity at a moment where so many things are changing to actually reevaluate and and make changes that maybe address challenges that were there before in in new ways. So I don't know. We, we've actually never talked about this whether this you know applies in the case of Hannah and how that might have come out. But I think that's you know worth mentioning as we have this conversation about just transition. Yeah, and and you know it it. So I'm glad we're talking a bit about the terminology and it's hard. If we talk about the terminology, I think we're going to step into the, the politicization muck. But it really feels like we're, you know, you've got governments now who um, are, are ragging the puck on the subject. And the federal government in this rechristening exercise or expunging the term just transition and rechristening the term to sustainable jobs really feels like they've taken a step back. Because David, oh, come, as you, come yeah. on, Ed, just jump into the muck. You don't, don't dance <laughs> around it. I mean, let's we're be not. honest. Of course, we're going to talk about the muck. Go All ahead. right, we're we're in the muck. Let's wallow in the muck. That's uh, that's my comfort zone. But they, it really feels like, and uh, uh, maybe uh, I should give credit to Corey Hogan on one of those West of Center shows. He might have made. I think he made this point. But it really feels like the federal government has taken a step back on it because, and to your point, David, it's not just about jobs. You know, and and I guess to your point, Sarah, like it's it's about overall community. It's 
it's not just replacing one worker and or one job with another job over here. Um, and to then reframe it around sustainable jobs seems to be really narrowing the focus. And then it just gets us away from the conversation that we're trying to have today, which is what do you actually do? How do you make it work? What kind of policy supports that you need? And puts us back into an Orwellian terminology debate, which is costing communities like Hannah precious time as they're trying to figure this out and prevent their property, their property prices from plunging. So sorry, that's a moment of exasperation while I wallow in the muck, but it just feels like we've taken steps back even in the last month. Go yeah, ahead, I think David. It's, it's kind of like an attempt at please everybody liberalism that just really gets me going. I mean, there are there are deep social challenges that we have in the country, but instead of a kind of discipline saying this is a cost effective, socially plausible way to really help help reduce the, the the gross inequalities in the country, you know, say by focuses on certain kinds of education or better support for people moving or what have you. The government is not building systematic things like that that can really help. It's trying to just focus on kind of wordsmithing in this wishy-washy way that's trying to please everybody and not actually governing effectively. So DeRay, you're again, you're on the ground. Like why give us your take. Why are we sort of wallowing in the muck here, not making any progress on it, stuck in a debate about terminology. Um, or tell us that we're wrong. Tell us that that's all just sort of high level politics playing out. It's Fed politics. And there actually is progress being made on the ground. Where do we sit? So there's local progress being made on the ground, um, just with the resiliency of our region. Um, and I think that, you know, trust is rooted in action. And I don't think that the region felt that there was much action behind any of the words of the last six years of, of what a just transition should look like. Um, our region, you know, yes, the the how retail housing market, um, real estate rather, um, was crazy in 2017. Like every block, there was like five houses and the, the prices were dropping. You know, today, we have 12 houses in our whole town that are available for purchase. So we've seen a complete flip upside down of, of what's happening. And the resiliency in our region and, you know, the ability to cope and move forward together um, has been and will continue to be our region's biggest asset. You know, we were told back in the 80s when the railroad, um, you know, when CN moved out of Hannah, that Hannah was going to die then. And we said, no, it's not. Um, you know, and we take steps forward and we, we change and we adapt. And it's the relationships within our region. It's not just the town of Hannah or just special areas. It's, it's all of our, our connections and those strong relationships that we're prepared to make this our home for, for us, our kids, our, our grandkids. Um, and if there's policies that, you know, help, thank you. Um, but I, I refer to like, I often get people send me articles of different things, like one that, you know, kind of struck a chord with me was a, a financial post article in late January and the doom and gloom. And, you know, they, they compared, you know, Hannah's unemployment rates have doubled what they were from 2017 to 2021. Yeah. Well, cause we were in a global pandemic too, but there's <laughs> that doom and gloom. You know, if you think you're helping us stop, we don't need your help. You know, if, we are creating a sense of hope and success for the future. Um, and so if policies can help that by being just and, you know, human centered with making economy, like all the ecosystems working as one, then we're all in. But if it's going to be completely based on um, a political direction or, you know, saying the victimizing of Hannah and how awful it is, we don't need your help. And, and so, Duray, do you think that the, the property prices, part of their rebound is now that the uncertainty has been partially addressed at least? So that the mine future is clear, the generating facility, it's, convert, it's converted from coal to gas under the 
current proposed clean electricity regulation, it could run like that to, you know, 2040. So there's a longer runway. Is that is that a big part of the question or am I overstating it? No, that that's part of it. Another part of it is people want to get the hell out of large urban centers during the pandemic. <laughs> Yeah. And so they came to our beautiful, safe, small community, um, sold their, you know, $1.3 million home in the city, came here, bought a nice little fixer up, invested in it, have retirement dollars um, and play pickleball all winter long at our beautiful rec facility. <laughs> <laughs> I've got to try this pickleball thing. I keep hearing about it every episode. Yeah. Yeah, my, well, my mother in law is a killer. Yeah. <laughs> well, but I think that David and I, David and I live in Canmore, and so we've certainly seen that. I've I've just been in Japan, and this has to be a worldwide phenomenon, at least in industrialized countries, because you're seeing this incredible drift. For years, it was drift from the rural areas to cities. Now there's this reverse worker migration. Post COVID, people can work remotely. And there you have in rural parts of Japan where people are buying properties, not for hundreds of thousands, for tens of thousands of dollars. Mm -hmm. The only a little bit of a maybe a, a gray cloud around this process is we've had some folks move to our community um, that need some social supports or some services that our, real, our rural community can't provide. Um, so that's been a little bit of a challenge. And, and my organization definitely has, um, you know, tried to support those individuals, connecting them to where they need to be connected. But that involves transportation. And we have no public transportation, which so there, like, it's been great, but there is some parts of it that, um, you know, it adds another little challenge that we need to work through. Sure. Uh, just a reminder to everyone tuning in, we're going to get to Q&A soon. Thanks for getting questions. I kind of don't know where to go from here. It might be either we talk about the difference between a coal community and an oil and gas community, perhaps the best way. Or we talk about maybe back to you, DeRay, like when you look to other communities that have gone ahead of you, when you look to positive examples and you say, that's what we should do, that's what we should model. Where have you looked? We haven't. Okay. Because it seems most of all, we're getting the those ass. Um, we seem to be a little bit further ahead of most other communities in Alberta, like so locally. Um, we have, you know, looked at some work done abroad when we were talking about our social resiliency study that we conducted and, you know, kind of compared it to, um, is there a process that helps a community through a crisis like this? There's lots of research on what it looks like as, you know, a natural disaster, but not as one that's been created um, by by industry, by policy. Um, so I've done a lot of, I, I can't even count how many interviews uh, that I've done um, as, you know, this is what we've done. We've seen this has worked. This has Sorry, DeRay, we've just lost you. You've just gone on mute. Unless it's my audio. No, nope, David, lost and I've lost DeRay too. We lost okay. the sound. Yeah. How about yeah. now? Oh, you're back. You're, you're back. back. Okay. You're back. We'll clean that up in post. Go ahead. <laughs> yep. Yeah. So we we actually have been a little bit, I think, of the. I know the the initial initial community for first steps. Um, you know, we have our neighbors at Forsberg area that's still connected, like with the Westmoreland. So same company that we've been walking through this together, but we haven't had a lot of opportunity to talk to folks that are, that are ahead of us, ahead of the process. You're really leading there. I wanted to come back to two things that you said just previously that I think also underscore sort of some of the elements of what governments can and can't do, right? And this idea of the, you know, this sort of macro trend of people moving to cities and then that being reversed and people moving out of cities. You know, I think it just underscores there is 
a limit to how much governments can control when it comes to just transition, right? And I think that, again, like, what are the tools that they can use when it comes to planning? Uh, you know, I would argue that if we if we do expect to see transition, and I mean, I think you just have to look to the U.S. to see um, coal plants, of course, also closing there, despite, you know, the fact that they don't have formalized coal phase out. Um, and, and certainly, I think, you know, we'll see similar things in other resource communities that, the transition will come and it's not about government sort of, you know, artificially creating a transition that wouldn't happen otherwise, but the, the good way to do it from a government policy perspective is to, you know, create plans that at least help to provide some of that certainty. And, and it sounds like they need to do a better job of providing more of that up front. Um, but that trying to, you know, kind of similar to the idea that, you know, governments can't control the macro trends of people wanting to be in cities or not, um, you know, they also can't control the macro trends of, of kind of energy, global energy demand when where we sit here in Alberta. Um, but also then coming to the, you know, where else can government support and and public transportation, right? Some of these things that, again, like you wouldn't necessarily, I think, be thinking about that from a just transition perspective, and certainly not if you take a purely energy lens on it, but that those are the kinds of supports that communities might lead need. Um, and that really requires governments to be, you know, more brave, I think, as as David was saying, like, I, I think about it a lot when it comes to innovation policy and the way that Canadian governments are sort of often afraid to to take risks and to spend money and, and do things. And I think that there is something similar when it comes into the just transition space where there's a lot of planning and saying what you're going to do and, you know, studies and, and it's really time to start, you know, spending some of the money and actually taking the actions and some of them will fail. Right. And like, we know that, you know, in the private sector, businesses fail and, and governments, I don't think we should hold to a higher standard um, necessarily. Uh, but, but the idea that, you know, we're not going to get action unless there is some allowance for governments just transition policies to have a range of successes, especially really early on when you're, you know, talking about the first communities. And then you hope that at least you can learn from that and you can, you know, pull back on the funding of things that are, that are not working as well. But I think that that is another piece when it comes to, you know, policymakers. And, and I mean, you said it in terms of you need that action to happen. Um, but I think that's maybe where that barrier comes from. And I don't think that action, like, I don't think anybody has expectation for perfection. Um, but there, <laughs> there has to be a willingness to to talk about what what is working well and, and what needs to change to do better. Um, and that's just not with the energy conversation. That's with any conversations we're having in our community. Um, you know, own, own when it doesn't work and own and celebrate when it does. Hey, uh, so let's let's get to questions here. And uh, while we're seeing if anyone wants to ask a question live, I've got one from uh, Peter Falloon here I'm going to read. Uh, and this looks like it's to you, DeRay. As you look back on the journey, are there things that surprised you in a positive manner? If yes, what can other communities learn from this experience? And you said that you're not looking to other communities, kind of you move first. So what can other communities learn from Hannah? Uh, I think um, making sure that there is um, everybody that needs to be at the table and how you identify that changes continuous, continuously. So, um, you know, all sectors, um, the honest, open conversations and being really real with that you need to work with your neighbors. Um, it's not, can't be a silo town of Hannah thing or a special areas thing or, you know, just social supports. It has to, it has to be genuine relationships um, working in the uh, same, same direction. And does that, that, does that involve working with other regions or counties that are in the same boat, like take Sturgeon County, which is also facing a lot of transition pressure. Have you, you know, maintain dialogue with them and others? Absolutely. Yeah. That, and that is so important. Got you. Okay. And I can't speak on their behalf and I can't speak on behalf of every individual that lives in our community. Um, but, you know, having that opportunity to agree to disagree or, you know, work through some best practices is is really been part of our ability mm -hmm. to to cope and change. Great. Now, Mike Hill's got a comment and question. He says, this seems like a much more abrupt situation of what is happening in farming communities all across North America and the world. And 
this is good. It's Jermaine to Hannah because it's got a big farming community as well. There's a general migration towards cities to fill the need for a more general labor shortage in trades and other professions. Isn't the role of government to ensure that policy invites continued diversification and social supports and continued growth within provinces or even federally? So David, Sarah, do you want to jump in on that? Yeah, I want to pick up on the sort of big picture point I was making earlier that th this is, I mean, the energy transition in some ways not big compared to some really big transitions we've seen. I mean, in North America, we went from having, you know, more than half of people involved in agriculture to 1%. It's a gigantic transition. And that's part of what drove all sorts of other economic growth as people poured into the cities. Um, and, and I think the answer is governments cannot control that, but governments at all levels can have some role of adjusting around the edges. So that was created by some big set of global technological changes, but governments can do some adjusting about the relative ease and investment in smaller towns versus bigger. And I think nobody, I assume almost nobody would say that we should have tried to keep everybody on the farming communities. We would have missed all the economic growth and change we've had. On the other hand, maybe we overdid it in urbanizing Canada. It would have been better to have a bunch more kind of mid-sized communities and and find ways to have government support to do that. And there are really successful Western democracies that do have more distributed uh, uh, economic activity, including high value-added economic activity. Think of Germany, where you see these uh, highly skilled little manufacturing uh, facilities scattered all around relatively small towns in Germany. And I think those are choices where government shouldn't be, in my opinion, the business of choosing exactly what happens in, in some place, but government can set some overall rules that adjust that transition. And that's where I think government should be acting. And, and again, to come back to my main point, mostly thinking about big policies for, for kind of social justice and separately thinking about that transition and not thinking of them as being tightly coupled. And do you think, I mean, back to you, David, like the U.S. with the Inflation Reduction Act, I mean, it's it's a perverse name because it's really an industrial strategy act. And it's it's made a big bet on that, on, okay, well, our economy to a certain degree is based on energy manufacturing. We're going to clean up manufacturing and the energy that we're going to produce, we're going to make um, increasingly clean. Canada has tried to do the same in fits and starts. I was in Ottawa at the end of January and talking about policy supports that would help to keep pace, help Canada to keep pace with, with the IRA, US yeah. and IRA. And the first question, whenever we had that conversation with any federal official was, if we do X, will it help us to keep pace with IRA? And generally <laughs> the answer was no, but keep trying. I don't think in Canada we're having like the mature conversation. We're not having a mature adult conversation around just transition, nor I think in any way we seriously tackled the mature um, adult conversation around the, the uh, contribution of oil and gas to the Canadian economy. And we know we're going to have to transition away from that. How do we replace that? And we've done that again in fits and starts, but it's good. We need to focus at the provincial level, needs to focus at the community level. We also really need to focus at the national level. And so far, we see a plan for a framework, for a plan, but nothing concrete, nothing like an industrial strategy that the U.S. has produced with IRA. I think, I think part of the challenge in the Alberta federal conversation has been the kind of political difficulty. I know maybe failure is easy to say. If I was one of the politicians, I'd have trouble too. It's the failure to be honest about the trade-offs. That if we really are going to transition to to low carbon, that does mean this enormous number of jobs going away. And somehow, the you know the, the liberal federal government doesn't quite want to be blunt about that. But the flip side of that is we have a all sorts of great strengths in our society, and we can make choices to try and drive new industries. But we have to do it at that scale. But but I guess doing it at that scale requires admitting that there's going to be big changes and consequences. And right now, the government I think is still not quite doing that on either side. I mean, the, either right or left government. And you've and, nailed the brand of energy versus climate, David, honest conversations about the trade-offs. Sorry, Sarah, I cut you off. I, I was just going to say, I would add that also industry is not doing that, right? And, and is very much saying, you know, if only government did X, Y, Z, then things would be fine and we wouldn't have to change at all. So, so I don't want to blame lay all the blame uh, on government for that one. <laughs> I, I agree with you 100%, but I do think there that's where there are different jobs. Oh, Industry yeah, yeah, job no, fundamentally it's, it's not their job. Play to win to inside that. the yeah. rules. Yeah. And it's exactly government's jobs to do this no, and not no, that's fair. Yeah. And Ed, yeah. you opened up the IRA box. I mean, there's a whole industrial policy conversation that I think we started once on a show that we should probably yeah. have again. Um, but I think that there is 
you know, I, I think there's a little bit too much framing of IRA as the U.S.'s big industrial policy push, as opposed to saying it's the, you know, icing on the industrial policy cake that they've been building. And if we try to just make a plate of icing in Canada and call that our industrial policy because we're competing with them uh, by doing the same thing, it's it's going to be about as good as a, a plate of icing would be. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and and Ira, by no means, you know, we've talked about it a few times, you know, we did that show in, with Catherine Hamilton on it. It's by no means perfect. And now they've got a bit of a, in the US, from what I gather, a post Ira hangover, and that is around labor availability and permitting. Yeah. So that it's great. You've opened up the spigots and you've got tax incentives for everyone, but then to actually actualize, to move that through the regulatory process, well, in a real hurry, you realize your deficiencies and your lack of bureaucrats able to administer these projects that are coming forward in the application queue. But maybe back to the really big Mike Hill question. Like, I feel like probably most Albertans don't think Alberta would be better if it all collapsed to be Edmonton and Calgary, right? So it'd be great to have some of these smaller size cities thrive. I, for for Dore's sake, I hope it's Hannah. I've dr- driven through Hannah and enjoyed it. I don't know well. But I think the issue is sort of setting policy that allows local municipalities and cities to compete a little bit to try and get to an outcome that I think lots of Albertans would want, where there is a, a range of cities that really are able to be successful and vibrant, not the distribution of really tiny towns we had in the agricultural heyday 100 years ago, but something that's also not just Edmonton and Calgary uh, taking over everything. Great. I want to turn back to Dre, and we've got a question here from James. And sorry, James, I don't see your, your last name here. Perhaps more to the point, how important is it for an older generation of male-dominated rural community leadership to actively <laughs> promote and make room for a younger generation of leadership that will likely be dominated by younger women? And I will, when I go back to the Hannah Solar Project and that group, like it was a bunch of dudes and you, like frankly. <laughs> <laughs> but you take this on, like is, is the, the leadership part of the problem, the current leadership? Mm-hmm. I don't know if it's part of the problem, um, but I do see it evolving. I do see that there there's changes in in who those champions around the table are going to be in that leadership role. Um, I I don't know if it's going to happen quickly, um, but I do see that evolution. And you know, there is opportunity for we have brilliant young people in our region, um, male, female, that that are going to take on that next challenge to be a champion for our region. Fair enough. Great. And since there is a question from uh, Erwin Dreeshen, just wanting to know a little bit more, since we've got a couple more minutes, or sorry, Dreeshen, sorry, Erwin, can you expand on the reasons why the solar project failed? There would appear to be plenty of money available now. Did it come too early? I've got some thoughts on that. I'm sure you do too. Yeah. I think we've actually had um, that situation pop up for us during this community transition is we were too early on quite a few things. Um, but we can we can take that as a learning um, and and I guess in in time is right, maybe there will will be opportunity. Um, but I know immediately for the coal affected workers and definitely aligning with David's thoughts, you know, not even a job for a job, but the, um, you know, equality in pay one pish position to the next was a huge at, uh, factor in, in our coal affected workers decisions of what their next steps were. Yeah. And I would add to that the problems at the time uh, and this was the tough hand that the then government uh, inherited. It was sort of economically broke, just heading into the doldrums. B, we said the way to make this happen, there's a cash injection, but we need a contract for difference policy. And even though they're running these rep rounds that were based on contracts for difference, uh, it's like, well, okay, we're still not totally familiar with it. And then C, it was... If we do this for Hannah, are we going to have to do it for every coal-affected community? And that process makes us really nervous. And the next thing you know, government deer in the headlights and didn't do anything. And then they were voted out and the project died. 
Um, that's a sour note to end on. <laughs> it is. <laughs> man, and man, Ed, Ed, you really just landed that on a downer. <laughs> but it's time to quit. <laughs> See, I said today I wouldn't do a good job moderating. I'd do a job. I've done a bit of a depressing job. But uh, such that it is. Um, we are out of time. Uh, DeRay, big thank you. Um, we really appreciate the time you took to come join us today and yeah, your you. commentary very well. and, and it's very cool just a, to reconnect with you and B to have someone, uh, in your position who is seeing the impacts on the ground, provide us with your thoughts and observations. So thanks so much. No, oh, very welcome. Uh, like I said, uh, anytime I have the opportunity to, um, talk about my community, uh, is a good day for me. I'm very passionate about the people, um, that live, choose to live here. And, uh, I'm, I'm excited for our future. I'm not saying that it's not going to be difficult at times, um, but we're pretty tenacious and uh, I'm looking forward to our, our growth and success. Um, sometimes you really got to be mindful of, you know, doing the right thing versus uh, doing things right. Yeah. Well, thanks so much for your work. I mean, Hannah needs people like you. Thank you. You're very welcome. My pleasure. It's, it's my community. Um, so uh, I definitely, I'm very proud to be part of um, my community in this region. And I love everything about it. Right. That's a much better note to end on. Uh, now, unfortunately, I have to end with my standard patter. A reminder that this episode will be available at energyversusclimate.com and on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen. Review and rate us on your favorite podcast platform. Uh, this helps new listeners to find the show. You can also always send us your feedback to info at energyversusclimate.com. We'll be back in a month's time, exact time TBD, with our next show and precise subject TBD. Uh, so subscribe on your favorite podcast platform and at energyversusclimate.com to find out when it's actually going to land. And uh, as always, thanks to Hannah Tai, Priya Kunikulato, Crystal Hickey, and our very patient producer, Eva Voinijescu, uh, for their support. See you next time, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you.